Good morning. I'm pleased to welcome each one of you to the online worship service of Park Street Baptist Church. We are located in Peterborough, Ontario, Canada. May God bless you as you worship with us and as we study the Bible together this Lord's Day, August 16th, 2020. Andrew Harbridge will lead our worship. Sylvie Copland will play and sing the children's song. Diane Richardson will tell the children's story. Malcolm Copland, who puts the service together, will also read the scripture this morning. And I'm David Richardson. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for forgiveness in Jesus. Help us to worship with joy this morning. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, I'll turn the service over to Andrew. Our first hymn this morning is Immortal Invisible. This hymn lists a lot of the attributes of God, and I invite you to make a mental note of each one as you sing it today. Our first scripture reading for this morning is taken from the book of Psalms, and I will be reading chapter 82. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Our next gospel song is The Sweet By and By. It was written by Joseph Webster and Sanford Bennett in the 19th century. And unfortunately, Joseph was, uh, he suffered from depression quite a bit, but he would come to life when he had a new song to write. 
Anyhow, this day, uh, he was rather depressed and his friend Sanford asked him, how are you doing? And he said, oh, it doesn't matter. It'll be all right by and by. That was the spark that was the inspiration for this song. The two got busy and within half an hour, they had written this song. a land that is fairer than day and by faith we can see it afar for the father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in that sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore we shall sing on that beautiful shore the melodious songs of the blast and our spirit shall sorrow no more. Not a sigh for the blessing of rest. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet. To our bountiful Father above We will offer our tribute of praise For the glorious gifts of His love And the blessings that hallow our days In the sweet by and by We shall be in that sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore our second scripture reading for this morning is taken from the book of john and i will be reading chapter 10 verses 22 through to 30 at that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe, because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. About 10 years ago, Bob and I made the album Reflections in Time, and this is another selection from that album called I Ask the Lord. Never be. 
Our contemporary hymn this morning is God So Loved, based on probably the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3.16.
Good morning, children. It's now your part of the service. Sylvie's going to lead you in a song, and after that, you'll have a story told to you by Diane. love you, Lord, and I live my Lord to worship you, O oh, my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear. Thank you, Sylvie and Malcolm. Good morning, children. What language do you think that God speaks? Did you say English? Well, yes, he does, but what else? He speaks every language because God made us all and can hear our prayers. Do you remember how we learned last Sunday that we are his sheep and lambs? The sheep hear his voice and follow him. They know him and he knows them. I have been talking to friends from different places in the world, and they have told me of how God's leading them and helping them and answering their prayers. They know and love the Lord and follow Him. Some of them speak Thai, others Dutch, some speak French or Spanish, and one good friend speaks Amharic. In our church we have students who speak Telugu or Tamil. Other people speak French, Filipino, and Cambodian, just to name a few. God understands each language and hears us when we pray. I have also been listening to some wonderful hymns and songs of praise. Some of them are in English, but some are in other languages. Each is beautiful. We just sang, I love you, Lord. God loves to hear us sing and praise him and to tell him that we love him. If we are his lambs and sheep, we will want to talk to him and obey him. Of course, people who do not know about Jesus can't hear him or obey him. That is why we have missionaries who go to other lands. They learn to speak the language there so that they can tell them about Jesus. Some even put the Bible in that language so that people can read it. Let's pray for people who don't know Jesus yet. Let's thank him that he knows every one of us, knows our language and hears us. Let us pray. Dear Lord, Thank you that you know and speak every language. Thank you that we can pray and sing to you. Thank you that you love every person and want them to know you. Please bless those who are telling people about you. Thank you for churches that are teaching about you too. Please help the children to remember to pray and sing to you and to say thanks for all of your blessings. Please keep our little ones safe and all of us close to your heart. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Andrew, Malcolm, Sylvie, and Diane. Let us pray. Our Father God, we worship you. We thank you that you ruled the universe from heaven. We ask that in our thoughts of you and in our talk of you, that we would not be casual or careless or unthinking, but that we would give reverence to you. Your kingdom is already among us in all those who worship your Son, Jesus. We pray that our obedience may be complete. Yet so many people have not given themselves over to him in obedience. And so we pray for the expansion of your kingdom over the whole world. We pray for those who minister the gospel. We pray especially for the people and ministries to which our church contributes. Give them wisdom and strength as they serve you, we pray. We thank you that you care for us from day to day. We ask that you would supply those things that we need, the food and shelter and clothes. But we pray that you would meet our other needs. Many of us suffer from illness or injury or other physical weakness. Some of us have struggles emotionally or mentally. We have those among us looking for the right job, for a change of living situation, and all of us have spiritual battles we face, whether obvious to others or not. And so we pray for healing and strength, and that you would meet our needs. This past week we have sinned. Sometimes we have been aware of our sin, sometimes not. We ask that you would help us to stay out of temptation, and we ask your forgiveness for having sinned against you and against others. And we ask that you would help us to forgive those who have offended us or hurt us in some way. We ask your protection from the evil around us. We ask your protection from the evil one himself. We know that he lies. Help us to recognize the truth and be obedient to it. Help us to resist him. Help us as we search out your word to yield ourselves in obedience to whatever truths we may find there. We ask all these things in the knowledge that you have the power and the authority to do them. Help us to yield ourselves to you and to honor you in every aspect of our lives. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus, who taught the disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. In the first part of chapter 10, Jesus spoke of himself as the Good Shepherd. His sheep are those who believe in him, whether from among the Jews he was speaking to at the time, or later from among the Gentiles. We saw that the Good Shepherd has a relationship with his sheep, a personal relationship. This reminds us that following Jesus is not just about rituals and righteousness, although rituals and righteousness are expected. Following Jesus is about our relationship with him. We also saw that the Good Shepherd cares for his sheep, to the point that he laid down his life for them. He died on the cross for those who believe in him. Jesus died to save them from their sin and to pay the penalty for their sin. Now let's continue. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple, in the colonnade of Solomon. I entitled my message, Jesus at Hanukkah, to catch your attention. Hanukkah is the name we know for the Feast of Dedication mentioned here by John. Between the completion of the Old Testament and the birth of Jesus, a Syrian named Antiochus Epiphanes captured Jerusalem and desecrated the temple. Among other things, he slaughtered a pig on the altar. 
a Jewish group called the Maccabees fought back, cleansed the temple, and rededicated it. Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication, celebrates that rededication. Since Hanukkah was a newer celebration, it was not one of those required by the Law of Moses. John mentioned the celebration without even telling us whether Jesus participated. All we know is that he was in the temple on this occasion. So the Jews gathered round him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. We might wonder about this ourselves. If Jesus was and is the Christ, why didn't he say so more plainly? Sometimes I've thought that the answer was cultural, that direct questions weren't answered directly, and that may have been a factor. But I wonder if this was also a matter of faith coming first. Before Jesus came, there was an expectancy among those who truly followed the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There was an eager waiting for the Messiah. When these ones met Jesus and heard him speak and saw the signs he did, they recognized him as their Messiah. They didn't need Jesus to persuade them that he was the Messiah, the Christ. They recognized in him the one they were looking for. Since my high school years, I have been interested in apologetics or the defense of the faith. I think apologetics is aimed at two groups. Many believers, perhaps most believers, need the encouragement of knowing that our faith is not unscientific or irrational. But we also defend the faith against attacks from outsiders, from people who have put their faith in science or philosophy or another religion. This second group are seldom persuaded to change their minds. We know that Jesus Christ is God the Son. But trying to persuade people who don't want to be persuaded seldom goes as planned. People who are unwilling to believe in Jesus don't suddenly change their minds because of our attempts to persuade them. It didn't work with the religious leaders either. And they weren't listening to second-hand explanations by defenders of the faith in our day. They were listening to Jesus himself. They were watching his actions, yet they were unwilling to see their Messiah in the signs Jesus did. They were unwilling to hear their Messiah in the words he spoke. So I don't believe for a moment that they were asking Jesus for an outright declaration so they could believe in him. They were asking for an outright declaration so they could challenge him or argue with him or use it against him. They asked him knowing they would reject his answer anyway. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. From Jesus' perspective, the religious leaders already had an answer. They just didn't believe it. And Jesus pointed, not to any particular statement that he had made, but to the signs that he had performed. Notice, by the way, that Jesus pointed to his works to prove who he was. You and I claim to be followers of Jesus. But at a certain point, it will be in our works that people will recognize us as believers. If we are hard-hearted and self-centered, if we have what the Bible calls eyes full of adultery, if we are short-tempered or substances control our lives, people won't believe us when we talk about having a personal relationship with Jesus. Jesus pointed to his works as proof of who he was. Let's make sure that people can point to our works as proof of who we are in Christ. So why didn't the religious leaders believe? Because they were not of his sheep. Although they were religious people, they didn't have genuine faith in God, the Father of our Lord Jesus. Most of them were not interested in a personal relationship with God. They were more interested in logically working out the details of rule-keeping and their outward religion. When God sent John the Baptist to prepare hearts for the coming of Jesus, they were quick to challenge him, but not quick to let him baptize them for repentance. They weren't God's sheep, so when Jesus came along, they weren't Jesus' sheep either. Because they weren't his sheep, they didn't believe in him. 
However, when Jesus was walking this earth, there were those who were still waiting, because they hadn't yet encountered Jesus, and those who had already come to believe in him as their Messiah. These are the ones Jesus called his sheep. They had already had their hearts open to the Father, so that when the Son came to this earth, they believed in him. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Jesus was speaking directly here of the wonderful personal relationship he had, and has, with his sheep. He spoke of this in the first part of this chapter. Here he repeated it. The disciples were able to walk and talk physically with the Master, but they had to be in the same room where he was, or with him on the hillside, in order to walk with him and talk with him. Jesus communicates with us now by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit used Jesus' disciples to write these words that we are studying, and he lives within each believer. He instructs us on how to understand and apply them to our lives. Because the Spirit of Jesus lives within each believer, he is actually closer to us than he was to the disciples during Hanukkah when he was at the temple. We have a close relationship with Jesus, a personal relationship with him. But notice that it results in following Jesus. And that has practical consequences. It means a life dedicated to Jesus, a life committed to obedience to his teachings. Here on earth, that is our direction. None of us are successfully there yet. To be in his presence at the end of our lives here on earth, that's our destination. But right now, here on earth, to be fully committed to him is our direction. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Notice that he mentions eternal life and perishing. In the book of Revelation, John described perishing as the second death. By contrast, Jesus gives those who believe in him eternal life. Sometimes he focused just on the word eternal. None of us wants to die, and as that time approaches, we look forward to living again and living forever. But what do we think of as life? Are we thinking of having fun forever? I suggest instead that we think of it this way. That anger that we've struggled to master will be gone, along with the self-centeredness and the pride that fueled it. That righteousness and purity of conduct that we've longed to display will be coming from within. Those fleeting moments of joy and worship that we experience here will overflow from our hearts. This life is only for believers, of course. John 3.16 says the same thing in almost the same words. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus speaks of his hand and the hand of God, meaning his care and protection. Those who believe, those who are Jesus' sheep, have a relationship with him that is special. We can count on him. No one can take us out of God's care. This would be good to know in times of persecution. Those times are coming for Jesus' disciples. First it would be the religious leaders among the Jews who would persecute the early church. Then it would be the Roman authorities. It would be important to know that those who persecuted them didn't have the power to take them away from Jesus. And Jesus made the point that his Father had given them to him. We saw this already in chapter 6. God has given those who were believers to Jesus. Jesus, who now held them in his hand, was doing so on behalf of the Father who had given them. And no one could take them out of the Father's care. I and the Father are one. Jesus may be referring to the fact that the Father and the Son were were one in purpose, they were of one mind, so that the believers who were kept safe by the Father in times past were now kept safe by the Son. But that oneness of purpose came out of the fact that Jesus 
was one with the Father at a deeper level. We often express that oneness by saying that Jesus was both God and human, something we cannot truly understand. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? Jesus knew why they were planning to stone him. When he said he was one with the Father, he was identifying himself as God. Jesus also knew how they would answer his question. He asked it in order to force them to think about what they were doing. Jesus pointed to his good works, but not just any good works. These were powerful works, like the healing of the blind man in chapter 9. These were works that God was using to draw them and the people to Jesus. But rather than allow themselves to be drawn to Jesus, they were about to stone him. The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. I find these religious leaders frustrating. If Jesus truly was both God in human form and the Messiah that was predicted in the Old Testament, and he was, then by saying so, he was only telling the truth. And if he was telling the truth, it wouldn't be blasphemy. The problem was that these men, although very religious, had put God in a box. They had decided that God could not, or would not, come down to earth in human form. Having decided that God couldn't, or wouldn't do that, then obviously he hadn't done that, and so Jesus was not telling the truth. They had already decided that Jesus was not the Messiah. They had decided that Jesus was only a man, nothing more than a man. And so logically, if he made himself out to be God, he must be blaspheming and lying too. Notice what they had not done. They had not evaluated Jesus' teaching and works and decided that he wasn't the Messiah. Rather, from the first, they had rejected him as the Messiah. And so they had to follow through and say that he was blaspheming and lying. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, you are gods? I would have preferred it if Jesus had answered much as I did a moment ago. If he had told the religious leaders that they were biased rather than logical. If he had told them they weren't looking at the evidence when they accused him of blasphemy. But Jesus' answer to them takes into account their knowledge of Scripture and their supposed commitment to believing it. So Jesus quoted Scripture to them. I found this to be one of the more difficult sayings of Jesus to understand. Jesus quoted an Old Testament Scripture that is already difficult. Then he used it in an unusual way to defend himself against the charge of blasphemy. I'll try to give you the explanation that I think is the best one. My comments are based on comments by Steve Gregg. First, using the word God to describe a human being did happen in the Old Testament. In fact, it was the Lord himself, speaking to Moses, who told him in Exodus 4.16 and in Exodus 7.1 that he would be as a God to Aaron and to Pharaoh. When Moses spoke to Aaron, it would be like God was speaking to Aaron. When Moses spoke to Pharaoh, it would be like God speaking to Pharaoh. Let's look now at the scripture that Jesus quoted. I said you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men you shall die, and fall like any prince. Asaph, writing in Psalm 82, 6, described the judges as gods. They were much like Moses in the book of Exodus, speaking on behalf of God. In that case, they were standing in the place of God as they exercised the judgment of God among the people. However, of these same judges, Asaph wrote in the following verse that they would die like men. Though they were speaking in the place of God, they weren't immortal gods, they were human beings. It was these scripture verses that Jesus quoted. Let's now consider Jesus' challenge to the religious leaders. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, 
Do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, You are blaspheming, because I said, I am the Son of God? Jesus said that Scripture cannot be broken. Steve Gregg commented that this word broken has the idea of being pulled apart, pulled to pieces. He was telling the religious leaders that they could not take Scripture apart in order to pick and choose the parts they wanted. They were ready to stone Jesus because blasphemy was forbidden in Leviticus 24. Jesus was saying they couldn't pick and choose between scriptures. They had to deal with Psalm 82 as well. By the way, that's true for us too. We cannot take scripture apart and use just the scriptures that we like or want or agree with. We cannot pick out the bits we like and ignore the parts we find inconvenient. We have to make sense of Scripture taken as a whole. In my opinion, this problem is epidemic in the modern church. Some Scriptures are never studied or even read, not because they're too hard to understand, rather because they go against popular culture in our society at the beginning of the 21st century. Let's continue. The one whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world is Jesus himself. He was consecrated, set apart for his role as the Messiah, by the Father. Then he was sent into the world by the Father. This was a point Jesus often made with the religious leaders. He called them gods to whom the word of God came. We aren't told how the word of God came to them, whether through the reading of the Old Testament or through prophets. But Jesus was reminding the religious leaders that in the Old Testament, in Psalm 82, these judges had been called gods, even though they were just human beings who themselves had been given God's word. With these things in mind, let's look at Jesus' argument. It goes something like this. If Asaph called them gods, Why are you saying that I am blaspheming for calling myself the Son of God? Put another way, if he called them gods, right in Scripture, then you have no reason to accuse me of blasphemy for calling myself the Son of God. Put yet another way, though these judges were just men, this psalm describes them as gods. So why are you making an issue out of the fact that I have called myself the Son of God. I'll be frank with you. I found it more convincing when Jesus said that his works proved that he had a right to call God his Father. But I'm one of his sheep. I believe in Jesus. I do find his works convincing. And then I have to remember that Jesus didn't say this first to me. He said it to the unbelieving religious leaders. Jesus used this argument against them. The religious leaders had seen Jesus' works, up close and personal, yet they didn't believe. So Jesus justified himself on basis of Scripture. They were used to picking through the Scripture to prove their point. So Jesus used their style of reasoning against them. Jesus wasn't speaking to me or to his sheep. He was speaking to the religious leaders of Israel at that time. If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works. Jesus was challenging the religious leaders. If Jesus hadn't been doing the works of God, then they would have a reason for not believing him. But since he was doing the works of God, then they should at least believe the works. I am sure that Jesus knew that if they believed the works, they would eventually understand who he was and believe in him. I find it interesting that Jesus was still leaving the door open for them. Despite the fact that they were so resistant, Jesus was encouraging them to just look at his works and recognize in them God's doing. Jesus was still being gracious with them and inviting them to join his sheep. That you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Jesus' original statement, the one that got him in trouble with the religious leaders, 
was the statement in verse 30 that he and the Father were one. While Jesus said that at the time to refer to having the same purpose as the Father, he was also identifying himself with God. Here he identified himself with God even more strongly. The Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Again they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. He went away again across the Jordan, to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. Their response was not good. They laid hands on him. They grabbed him in order to arrest him. But he was able to get away. Jesus left Jerusalem and went back to where he'd been first introduced as the Messiah, back across the Jordan. John, the author of this book, never mentions himself by name. The John he referred to here was John the Baptist. It was John the Baptist who had introduced Jesus as the Messiah, and some of John's disciples had followed Jesus. And many came to him. They said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true, and many believed in him there. These many who came to him are more examples of God's sheep that he gave to Jesus. They were comparing Jesus' ministry with that of John the Baptist. John had not done signs. He had preached repentance in readiness for the coming Messiah. When he had encountered Jesus, he recognized him as the Messiah and said so. It seems that once again some of John's disciples were becoming followers of Jesus. They had recognized that John was not the Messiah, but that everything he had said about Jesus as Messiah was true. Remember that repentance was a focal point of John's ministry. John the Baptist had preached repentance from sin in anticipation of the coming of the Messiah. Each of John's disciples had been baptized to indicate their repentance from their sins. We aren't told what they repented of, whether it was the general self-centeredness that contaminates much of the good we do and say, or whether it was even more damaging sins, like murder or adultery. But we know that they had repented, and later, when they met Jesus, they believed. By contrast, the religious leaders were not repentant at all. They had gone to see John the Baptist to question him, but not because they were submitting to his ministry. They proudly assumed that they were righteous, more righteous than the common folk, and that they didn't need to repent. Yet over and over again, we are told that they wanted to kill Jesus. Eventually, they would take Jesus to the Roman court, where Pilate would convict him and send him to the cross. They were far from repentant of their murderous thoughts, and they certainly didn't believe in Jesus. I mention this because repentance is important to us as well. Most of us were told, when we first began to follow Jesus, that we had to repent of our sins. But repentance is still important. Following Jesus is not about living ordinary sinful lives on earth with heaven tacked on at the end. Following Jesus is about being saved from sin itself and not just from the eternal consequences of sin. So repentance is necessary. It's an attitude we have to carry with us, so that we are repentant of sins we have committed since we first followed Jesus, so that we are repentant of sins we have committed as recently as this day. And we must believe in Jesus, like these disciples of John the Baptist. Charlotte Elliott wrote the lyrics to Just As I Am back in the 1800s. She was repentant of sin that she described as a dark blot. She believed Jesus. She was coming to Jesus just as she was, a sinner. She could not plead innocence, and she knew her good deeds weren't enough. She could plead only Jesus' blood, the blood of the sacrificial lamb. This song is often used as an invitation to come for the first time to Jesus. But it's true for any of us who are repentant about our sins, whether sins of last year, or last week, or yesterday. We cannot plead innocence. Our consciences 
tell us otherwise. Let's once again plead Jesus' blood. We can all ask forgiveness because Jesus died as a sacrificial lamb to save us from our sins. Let's pay attention to the words as Andrew plays, Just As I Am. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen. 